Welcome back to this third segment in this law session relating to answering exam questions in relation to common law reason and institutions, also English legal system. Now, I will of course return to the University of London International Programme's past exam questions to ask or to look at question 7 of the 2010 paper which is a question relating to precedent. Again, uh, as I've referred to in the previous uh, segments, I want you to focus on the question that is being asked. So, even if you identify the particular topic, I then want you to look at the substance of the question that is being asked. So let's consider this question. It said, the predominant value of the doctrine of precedent remains the maintenance of judicial authority rather than that of responding to the needs of justice in individual cases. Let's go again. The predominant value of the doctrine of precedent remains the maintenance of judicial authority rather than that of responding to the needs of justice in individual cases. The predominant value of the doctrine of precedent remains the maintenance of judicial authority rather than that of responding to the needs of justice. What are we looking at? There are some important words in there. Predominant value. Here's the problem. Most law examinees will just see doctrine of precedent and that's it. But you have to look at the value remains maintaining judicial authority. So maintaining judicial authority is an important point. The words, and it, it's about reading the question. So what they're looking at here is saying that when you look at the doctrine of precedent, the main thing is maintaining judicial authority and there's a lesser role being played in respect of uh, individual cases and the justice in those individual cases. So on the exam paper, of course, you will get a question usually phrased along the doctrine of precedent lines. It is, after all, uh, an ELS or a common law reasoning paper. It is highly unlikely you will get a paper that does not involve precedent. It's nigh impossible. Even if it doesn't come in all its glory by itself, it is highly likely that it will be uh, in included with some other topic. So the whole concept of uh, the English legal system and common law reasoning is that the notion of precedent is important. So something in there will include the doctrine of pre precedent and generally you may have something looking at how judges uh, articulate legal principles and the rules and looking at how their judgments uh, come about and certainly how their reasoning based on uh, for example, stare decisis and previously decided cases are generally dealt with. Now, this area generally, as I say, uh, is considered an exam paper, even if it doesn't come on its own or looking at uh, statutory interpretation. By and large, they tend to be two separate questions, but when you look at statutory interpretation together with, with the idea of precedent and judicial reasoning, these involve very basic and cornerstone principles when you're looking at legal skills uh, in the context of common law reasoning. Now, you have to be careful not to take the everything I know about precedent approach. The question is specific. It talks about the doctrine maintaining judicial authority and that it does not respond to the needs of justice and then specifically in individual cases. So those are the things that you have to bear in mind as you basically spew forth what you know about uh, precedent. So you must ensure that you are reading uh, the cases, for example. Uh, one of the most important cases, of course, that I think that students uh, can have, uh, shall have read uh, when you look at uh, common law reasoning is the case of Donahue and Stevenson. Now, it is important. Most 
uh, times when you look at a syllabus which looks at cases and even uh, the development of the common law, uh, the doctrine of precedent, by and large, you don't need to wait until you get to second year or third year or whatever uh, and to do the law of tort to know what uh, Donahue and Stevenson is about. Because Donahue and Stevenson is one of those cases where you generally will get it somewhere on your syllabus or you will be required to read it in order to be able to delve properly in looking at how judges reason. Now, by and large, uh, law students tend to get lazy sometimes and they just want to see the case summaries. Now, I am not going to be one of those people who say, oh no, you must read every single case. You simply cannot. It is not possible. But what you must do is you must be able to at least read the important cases, not just for the facts or read the head note, but you should be able to read the cases to see how the judges articulate uh, their reasoning and their decisions. Because if nothing else, it will help you in your own writing. So if you read no other case, you should look at the case of Donahue in order to see the formulation of a principle by the court. Now sometimes uh, you have to read case summaries, as I say, and that's par for the course. When you're saying, right, you know the principle and you have a case in order to back up that principle, that's fine. I will still say it is impossible to read every single case. It is not possible, not unless you have no job, no life, nothing, and you are simply from the time you get up or you get up at three in the morning till midnight and you go to every single case. It's simply not possible. Of course, in practice, if you know the principle of the case, and then you have a similar case before you, you are going to go and read that case to try and find out what the reasoning was. But as a law student, there are certain cases which, in my view, you must read. When you look at things like uh, cases like Carlyle and Carbolic Smoke, well, I think you have to read it because it's only by reading it that you're going to understand it. When you look at a case like Donahue and Stevenson, you have to read it. To really understand judicial reasoning, you read a case and read it uh, as well in cases where you're looking at statutory interpretation. Very important because it allows you to see how the courts uh, discuss and articulate their reasoning. Now this, going back to the question, the specific question was set in terms of the maintenance, the maintenance of judicial authority and that needed to be contrasted uh, to responding to the needs of justice in individual cases. Now, in answering the question and focusing on it in a narrow context, you could, of course, have discussed the attempts that Lord Denning uh, had made in respect of him uh, sitting in the Court of Appeal and looking at what he said about the Court of Appeal breaking free of this uh, vertical precedent, meaning uh, that courts lower in the hierarchy must follow the decisions of courts higher in the hierarchy. Uh, but you could discuss it, of course, in a more broader context than that. So you could look at maintaining, uh, as I say, the whole judicial context by looking at the hierarchy, but looking at how Lord Denning's interpretation, as it were, of how the practice statement uh, should really uh, pan out. Now, you can look at it from that standpoint, but you can look at it from a broader context and pull cases in to respond to that. Now, in a common law system, uh, when you look at precedent, it is the primary glue, as they say, that literally holds the system together because the idea of precedent is unknown in a civil law jurisdiction. So it plays a vital role in the common law system. And that is why when you look at a question like this, you need to then be able to frame your knowledge of precedent within the question. So when you look at precedent, it sets up a hierarch hierarchical structure. The whole structure of the court system is one where you have a lot of courts, you have the courts of first instance, you have smaller courts, you have higher courts, right up to the peak where you have the Supreme Court. And when you look at the authority of the higher courts, it is generally maintained by the doctrine of precedent. 
But of course, you have to ensure that even with this consistent precedent uh, structure, there needs to be flexibility. So when you look at the flexibility, it comes in by way of the interpretation. And then you would have to look at the interpretation to look at the individual cases. And that's where now the issue of justice comes in. Now, again, you should know uh, in depth certain cases, not just cases where you know the head note or you know the principal, but know some in depth because it allows you to be able to articulate your, your, your own discussions better. So when you look at cases, for example, where there has been a dissent in judgment, again, go back to Donahue. When you look at uh, the whole formulation that uh, Lord Atkin made there with his uh, neighbor principal, Lord Buckmaster in the case did have something to say about it. So you should look at what the majority says uh, in the case, the, the, the main are discussion in the case, the ratio, but also look at dissenting discussions. So for example, if you were to look in detail at Donahue, you would see that it contrasted most of the judgments of Lord Atkin uh, against that of Lord Buckmaster. And Lord Atkin's judgment is regarded as a leading judgment when you look at the common law, not just for the principle that it establishes there, but for the methods he uses in his reasoning and how clear he articulates the position he takes. Now, Lord Atkin begins by stating, contrary to uh, Lord Buckmaster, of course, who seemed to end his judgment with the policy decision that the sole question in the case was legal, legal he poses as a question for the system. Does the legal system provide an answer to Mrs. Donahue? Now, in setting out uh, any sort of answer, he remarks that it is difficult to find statements of general application in the cases which have gone before. And so Lord Atkin explains that what he is going to do in contrast to the position that Lord Buckmaster takes, is that he would articulate a general principle. Now, Lord Atkin created this neighbor principle, but what he did go through and say was that he was consciously articulating a principle of general application, but what he said is, or rather was, he said, even though I'm setting this out as a general principle of application, please do not think that I'm going off on some jaunt of my own and just pulling this out of thin air. He said, this principle is inherent in the case law which has gone before and I have relied on the case law. So he goes back to looking at the cases and certainly even when you look at cases like Heaven and Penda which have gone before, the, he looks at what was... Uh, uh, what obtained in the cases and what was there before in order to come to his articulation. And that's what you need to read the cases for, to look at that and to see whether um, consciously there's a preservation of judicial authority. Now, that is my suggestion in respect of your approach in this question. I would suggest that we take yet another short break and then when we return, we will look at the civil justice system now, if you are signed up again to our premium service, then uh, contact us. We will, of course, give you a sample answer to this particular question, which I've written in time conditions of under 35 minutes. Now, we will take a break, as I said, and when we come back in the final segment, we will look at a question which focuses on civil justice. <music> 